We're continuing on in our series in Matthew, and uh, I'd like to start with a question this morning. What is it that motivates you? What gets you up and gets you pumped up? What makes you look forward to something or makes you interested in something? And, and for a lot of us, it's different things. Uh, some of us will do a hard thing in order to get a reward. Uh, we will we'll, we'll clean the bathroom and then we'll reward ourselves with a chocolate chip cookie. Um, we'll mow the lawn and then we'll go hit a bucket of balls. Uh, for some of us, it's more competitive. Like we will want to do something with someone and we're motivated that we could actually outdo them in something. And when it comes to the idea of status and rewards, uh, Jesus actually would like us to think about them quite differently. And so this morning we are beginning in Matthew chapter 20, and it says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out, uh, excuse me, went out in the early morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius. Uh, in case you don't know, that's a very generous wage for the day and sent them into his vineyard. And about nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. And he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went and he went out again about noon and, and about three in the afternoon and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they, asked, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. And the workers who were hired at five in the afternoon came in and each received a denarius. So when he came to those who were hired first, they expected to receive more. Each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. And these who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and, listen to this, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. But the landowner answered one of them, I am not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Uh, people get offended about God for lots of reasons. Some people are just offended by the standards that he has, the, the commandments that he gives, the direction that he provides. Uh, some people get uh, offended by the, the judgment or the justice that he brings or the lack of it. But I don't know anything. I don't know anything that is quite as offensive to people as God's grace. And this parable kind of unpacks that. Jesus had a remarkable capacity to, to take stories and teach us incredible truths, but not just teach us truths about God, reveal things about ourselves. And so if you remember last Sunday when we concluded our message, there was a, this passage where Jesus had interacted with a, a person who's three things we all wish we were. He was, he was rich, he was young, and he was a ruler. And all of us want to be those things. And, and Jesus gave him an opportunity to follow him. The words, come on, follow me. And, and he went away and he was very sad because he didn't want to give up the things that he had. And, and Peter's response in that moment to Jesus was, we have given up everything. What do we get? I'm not making that up. Chapter 19, you can look and see. What do we get? Peter says out loud what we all think. 
What do we get? And, uh, and, and Jesus responds. It's, it's kind of a prolonged response. And the parable that he tells is actually related to this. He wants to know what the reward will, what, will be. He wants to know what his status will be. He's revealing something of what motivates him in his service of Jesus. And of course, there are rewards and there, there is status, but, but something else is going on. Peter's focused on rewards. Jesus, as always, focuses on our hearts. Jesus uses a statement at the end of chapter 19 and then repeats it in chapter 20. Many who are first will be last. Many who are last will be first. Uh, Jesus talks about the many often in the Gospel of Matthew. He talks about many who will fall away. He talks about many who will claim to do great things in his name. He talks about many who will be deceived. It's not everyone. It's just the basic idea that there are some trends you can expect to see in the world in which we live. But Peter's question identifies something that's really interesting. He understood that what he had given up for Jesus was significant to him. But the problem wasn't what he sacrificed. The problem for Peter was how he looked at others because of his sacrifice. There was the challenge. He gave up a lot, and then he looks at you differently because of it. Because of it. And he became self-conscious. Is anyone else self-conscious besides me? There's reason you're not raising your hand is because you're <laughs> self-conscious. Don't want to be singled out. Well, let me just check. Anybody here consider yourself a good dancer? No. Oh, we got one over there. Jonathan is a great dancer if you've not seen him at a wedding. Yeah. I'm the most self-conscious dancer in the world. I just, I, it's not like I lack rhythm. Just, I feel stupid. <laughs> and so if you see me on a dance floor, uh, there is a video of a wedding that took place like, I don't know, 30 years ago. And uh, only I have seen it. I don't know where it is but I think God got rid of it <laughs> just to protect me. It's very easy, think about this, it's very easy to become self-conscious about things that we don't think we do well, but there's another kind of self-consciousness. It's a self-consciousness that comes because we think we did something well. And this is really interesting. And one of the challenges is the, the, the faith community, the religious communities are susceptible to this. It, the world is not exempt from it. Anybody who thinks they do something well, like they call a lot of attention to themselves, but we don't seem to be exempt from it. We have this kind of self-consciousness. And what Peter does is that because he was comparing himself to a wealthy person who wanted to keep his stuff, he was feeling pretty good about all the stuff that he had given up. Christians, we, sometimes we get accused of comparing ourselves to sinners, but that's not the only comparisons we make. Sometimes we compare ourselves to other believers who aren't working as hard or giving as much. And sometimes we can question their dedication, their commitment, their motivations how easy it is to question the commitment of someone else. And, and Jesus' point here is not to say, look at the way you think. That's not what he's doing. He's exposing that, but he wants to remind us that what motivates God can also motivate us. Now, Jesus is really consistent in his word pictures. Uh, when you go through his parables, he often sets things up so that they can be easily interpreted by any of his hearers. For example, the landowner often represents God, and the workers often represent the disciples, and the, the field or the vineyard often represents people who've not yet connected to God. Remember back in Matthew chapter 9, Jesus talked to his disciples, and he said this. He said, the harvest is huge, but there's hardly any workers. 
And he was talking about this idea. There are, there are all these people who have not connected with God, with his grace, with his truth. And the disciples are workers. That's what God calls us to do. God calls every single follower of his to participate in helping other people connect to Jesus. In fact, on your way in, you saw the, the wall art in the lobby, didn't you? A picture of Jesus made up of the names of your friends, your families, your neighbors, your co-workers, your loved ones, who you would love to see come to Jesus. And, and you made a commitment and, and you decided that every day for a month you would, you would hold those people individually up by name to Christ in prayer and ask for ways that they could be introduced to his love and grace. And maybe you're here and you're going, oh, I forgot about that. So start again today. It's not too late. And what he says is, all of us are called to help people connect. And there's a sense of urgency. The, the, the landowner goes out at the beginning of the, the story at six o'clock in the morning and he hires everyone who's available and sends them into the field. And, and and if you are in agriculture, you know, you don't just leave a ripe harvest in a field. You don't just leave the grapes on the vine. Like this needs to be taken care of. And there's a sense of urgency. You don't know what the weather's going to do. Things can rot on the vine. Like you've got to take action. And, and at nine o'clock, he's doing the math. We're not going to get this done. He goes out and he hires some more. And at noon, he hires some more. And at three, he hires some more. And at five o'clock, he's still urgently trying to get all the harvest in. Aren't you glad that God has a sense of urgency that every single person on the face of our planet should be part of his family and he never gives up on that? Never once, not once. And so there's only an hour left at six. That's when quitting time is. And, and, he, and he goes out and he finds some people at five o'clock and he says, why are you standing here? And they said, nobody hired us. And he said, all right, I'll pay you what's fair. And they all go to work. And... Uh, by the way, if you're not working at five o'clock, you probably don't have any expectation you're going to be hired that day. And the different times of the day that people are hired can represent all different kinds of things, but I don't think that's the major thing that we're looking at. The thing that we're looking at is that Jesus called them all to work. Jesus calls us all to work. But we should be very careful not to assume that our work is what gains us access to God's kingdom or access to forgiveness or access to eternal life. Ephesians, the second chapter, puts it like this. It was by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, listen to this, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. We don't work to get spiritual life, but we work out of our spiritual life. And that's the gift that God gives. Now, if the landowner had gone to the foreman and said, I want you to pay everybody, start with the people who started first, pay them, and then after they're gone, pay the people who came in at nine, then 12, then three, then five. There, this would be the end of the story. There'd be no controversy. But the landowner says, start with the people who started last. And so they come in for their pay and they get a denarius. And everybody's stunned. Well, the people who just worked one hour, they're stunned. And, and the people who worked three hours and, and six hours and, and nine hours. And, and the people at, at 12 hours, do you know what they're doing? W wow. I'll bet I'll get even more. I'll bet I'll get even more. And Jesus is driving a point home. He wants us to understand that God deals with us based on his grace, not on our works. Many of the firsts will be last. Many of the last will be first. Now, the first worked 12 times longer than everybody else. They bore the heat of the day. They did a lot more work. They endured a full day. 
And when, and, and when they were offered a job at six o'clock in the morning, they were happy for the offer. And when they were told what the wage was, they were happy with the wage. But when they saw the last workers hired get a full denarius, their expectations changed. And they thought, oh, we're going to get even more. And in their complaint against the landowner, they said something really intriguing. You made them equal to us. There is in our world a lot of focus on making sure we are equal to others. But in God's kingdom, he makes everyone equal to us. We like the idea of being equal to someone else. We struggle with the idea of others being equal with us, especially when we feel like we've done more, we've worked harder, we've sacrificed more, we showed up more times, we put more energy in, we released more resources, we've done more. And when Jesus comes and he pays the same, we're a little bit ticked off with him. I don't have to go outside of the church to find people who are offended with God. You made them equal with us. Expecting more from God because we believe we deserve more is not faith. It is pride. And Jesus is going after that in this story. If I did that for them, if God did that for them, then I should get, and we imagine something more. So they grumble, they blame the landowner, they consider this unfair, inequitable, and, uh, and what they don't think about is they were very happy when they were offered an opportunity to work for the landowner. They were very happy that they could spend time doing work that actually mattered. They were very happy with the wage that they were going to receive. They were very happy that they didn't have to do that alone, that there were other people who came alongside and worked with them. And they were rewarded for their labor. But it goes back to Peter's question, doesn't it? What's in it for us? And this is when grace seems unfair. But the landowner didn't break his word. The landowner just exceeded our expectations of generosity. And that's a hard thing for us sometimes. So Jesus, or the, the landowner goes to the, the disgruntled employees and, and he, he calls them friend. That's a really interesting word that he used right there. And they believe that they've been wronged and they believe that they deserved more. And then he does something that God does. He asks questions. And this is a really, really interesting thing. Someday I'm going to do a series, a message series, just on the questions God asks. Because we focus a lot on the commands, but those questions are a big deal. You can go all the way back to Genesis. Adam and Eve, when they first fell, God starts with questions, and, and he does too. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Are you envious because I'm generous? The questions of God can make us very uncomfortable. But God is revealing that he sees things differently than we do, and he thinks thoughts that are different than our thoughts. In fact, Isaiah would prophesy about this hundreds and hundreds of years before this moment. In Isaiah 55, he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. What seems unfair to us is often just an extravagant gift of grace from God. And he sees it differently than we do. So self-consciousness about what we have done can make us feel less valued. If you've done sinful things, we can feel less valuable, but if you've done grateful things, gracious things, generous things, and people don't recognize it, you can feel less valued because they didn't see what you've done. Many of the last will become first. Many of the first will become last. The last become first because of grace. The first become last because of self-confidence. 
Scripture tells us to rejoice with those who rejoice. You're trying to get an increase in pay, and then somebody you know gets an increase in pay. Are you able to rejoice with them? Are you able to celebrate with them? We're called to weep with those who weep. Maybe things did go well for you, but things are going hard for them. Do you get frustrated? Because now you have to show comfort. Here's what I want you to see is that the grace of God is actually not motivated the way we think of motivation. God is not more motivated for us because we work harder for him. I know there's some people in the room right now saying, Pastor, this is crazy talk. Do you have any idea how many people are going to stop volunteering now? <laughs> what motivates God is not how many hours you put in or how many dollars you give. What motivates God, this will be offensive too, what motivates God is not a sense of justice. God doesn't interact in your life because he thinks something has been done unfair and he's going to write that for you. Our world keeps using that word. Uh, what they really mean is, is some kind of vengeance, but they call it justice. Uh, justice without forgiveness is vengeance. So our world is kind of high on that right now, but justice is not what motivates God. Pity is not what motivates God. Oh, just look at him. Look what he's gone through. Look at all what she has to endure. I just feel so bad for her. I think I'm going to, to do something about that. If you think God is motivated by our efforts or by justice or by pity, you don't understand God. What motivates God, pure and simple, is love. Every time, all the time, unfailing love unfailing love. And if you think you get good things because of justice or because of pity or because of effort, you have no idea what you get from a heavenly father who just outrageously, unendingly, unreservedly, and unapologetically loves us every single day of our lives. Amen? So I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. What motivates you? I wish I could tell you that all the things that motivate me are, are pure and holy, but that's not true. I've got a competitive streak in me. I'm not a bad loser, but I will never give you one thing. <laughs> if you beat me, it's because you beat me. But we see others that don't try as hard or at least that's our perception. Have more and don't give as much. They seem to care less. And then it appears as though they're getting something even more than we have received. And we're disappointed. And our disappointments always reveal what our expectations were. What did you think you were entitled to? What did you think you were exempt from? Jesus was entitled to everything. He gave it all up so we could have life eternal. Jesus could have been exempt from everything. He didn't have to know a single moment of fatigue. He didn't have to know a single moment of pain. He was the son of the living God. He came from all eternity. And he didn't have to give any of it up. But he was so tired, he would sleep in the bottom of a boat in the middle of a storm. He would get hungry. And when the nails went into his hands and feet, they didn't hurt less because he was Jesus. They hurt more. We have no idea how much sin has numbed us to the pain of our world. God gives, God gives us love that we have not earned, and grace that we do not deserve. And he gives us work to do that actually matters. And he gives us fellowship in a mission that actually makes a difference. And he gives a life that is worth living and life that is unending. And how many are very grateful we have a God like that? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> Heavenly Father, would you help us examine our own motives? 
the truth is, is that a lot of things can motivate us, but what we want to be motivated by is love. The only example we see that is unfaltering in our lives and in our world of that is you. So would you help us receive your love? Would you help us rejoice when others receive your love? And would you help us be sharers and bearers of your love to others? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.